All right. Hey, welcome, everybody. So, welcome here. And again, thanks to you all for coming. And also, thanks to everybody on Zoom. This is our second McGowan Center hybrid event, as I was telling the students. So, that means it's experimental. And I hope it's going to work. And I hope everybody on Zoom can hear me. And when I go back to my computer, there won't be, you know, 70 angry messages in the chat. So, we'll see. My name is Bernard Prusak, and I'm the director of the McGowan Center for Ethics and Social Responsibility at King's College. All of you know where King's College is. If you're joining us by Zoom, you might not. King's is a liberal arts college sponsored by the Congregation of Holy Cross, and we're in Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania, which is more or less the northeast corner of the state. Uh, I want to say special thanks to our speakers. I also want to say those special thanks to my colleague, Joe Strubeck. So uh, Joe's in the back there. We spent uh, two hours yesterday toiling on the audio to make sure that it, it would work. And I hope it's working now too. So thanks again, Joe. Uh, so quick bios uh, for our second um, annual Earth Day lecture. Mark Wallace is professor of religion and the James Hormel professor of social justice at Swarthmore College, which is down the highway from us in Philadelphia. His teaching and research interests focus in the emerging field of religion and ecology, which considers how different religious traditions have shaped human beings' fundamental outlooks on the environment in ancient and modern times. His books include When God Was a Bird, Christianity, Animism, and the Reenchantment of the World, which was recognized in 2019 as the best book published that year in Western religious thought. Green Christianity, Five Ways to a Sustainable Future from 2000, and Finding God in the Singing River, Christianity, Spirit, Nature from 2005. My colleague, Matthew Eaton, is Assistant Professor of Theology at King's. He'll present the response since Thanks to Matt for bringing all your students here uh, this evening. His research focuses also on religion and ecology in conversation with continental philosophy and ethics. He's co-editor of three books, including Encountering Earth, Thinking Theology with the More Than Human World. And by the way, for his students, that book is available in our campus store. There's now an, uh, a faculty corner, though it happens that the faculty in fact, behind the counter. But Matt's book is there, so go and buy it since Mark has a chapter in it as well, I saw. Matt has published papers on post-humanist ecologies, environmental theologies, and animal ethics, and he is nearing completion of a book entitled Incarnate Earth, Deep Incarnation, and the Face of Christ. So nuts and bolts, uh, Professor Wallace will speak for 20 to 30 minutes, more or less, Professor Eaton, We'll give a seven to 10 minute response. Um, at that point, we'll turn to Q&A. We'll go until about eight or 8.15. 8.15 will be our hard stop, but between eight and 8.15, we'll see how the Q&A goes. Here in the room, I think you know how to ask, ask a question. You simply raise your hand the old fashioned way. If you're on Zoom, uh, please send your question to me, Bernard Prusak, through the chat. So you can send questions uh, through the chat, which is at the bottom of the Zoom screen to the co-hosts and choose me please do my best to get your question into the mix this event is being recorded and the recording will be posted on the mcgowan center's youtube channel either really late tonight or more likely tomorrow so thank you again. Yeah. I want to thank uh, Professor Prusak and also Professor Eaton for this invitation tonight. I'm really happy to be here. Um, it's a bit of a sacrifice. I'm coming out of the Philadelphia area, and uh, the Philadelphia 76ers are in Toronto tonight, the NBA playoffs. So I had to think, okay, where are my priorities? And I thought, no, they're in college, not the basketball team. But I'm very happy to be here. And um, I want to talk with you about my own journey. Uh, as a person who has tried to make sense of the wider world that we inhabit as a living place. And to do that, I wanna start with a story. Uh, when I was about your age, many, many years ago, when I was in college uh, at the University of California at Santa Barbara. 
Now, as a very young person in my teens, I used to get up early and I would go outside where I could be alone. And then in college, I did the same thing by walking by a lagoon area that was at the UC Santa Barbara campus, uh, a wooded area. And one morning I was out there all by myself early in the morning and I entered a clearing. And what I thought was a large dog came out through the, came up through the clearing bounded from the woods towards me, raised upon its hind legs, and it put its huge paws on my shoulders. And I remember I froze. I couldn't move. I couldn't breathe. And I thought, this is a big dog, but it didn't look like any dog I had ever seen before. It presented a long, commanding muzzle. It had these penetrating yellow eyes and massive shoulders, and a rope was tied around its neck. And a young woman appeared through the trees and spoke to me, don't move, it's a wolf. And the wolf and I locked eyes for a moment. And in a flash, the woman reached out to grab the loose end of the rope, the creature bounced off my shoulders and they both disappeared into the woods. That morning, I entered another world, a world that didn't make sense within the assumptions of, at that time, my everyday experience. And prior to this encounter, my life followed the basic routines kept by many of us. I lived and worked in temperature-controlled buildings. I ate processed, prepackaged food. I relied on fossil fuels to get me around, and I didn't account for the real cost of the planet based on my consumerist lifestyle. I basically interacted with the wider expanse of non-human nature as a kind of passing show and not especially relevant to what really mattered to me at that point in my life. But when I lock eyes with a wolf a few inches from my face and all of my fear and vulnerability, that shocked me into the painful realization that I was badly prepared for this other world the natural world in all of its otherness and in its mystery and in its force. Amidst the busyness of my everyday existence, something was happening, something strange just outside my college dormitory window. Something I couldn't have expected. You may know the story that after Jesus's resurrection in the gospels, he was with two disciples and they were walking on the road to Emmaus and they didn't recognize him. And that's kind of like what happened to me. Before the lagoon wolf, I was like those disciples. I was ignorant of what was taking place right in front of me. I was a person of faith and I'd always believed in like revelation, but now I was beginning to see that the gift of life itself in all of its beauty and power is a continuous revelation. Let me suggest a certain way of understanding this other world based on a fresh reading of a story in the Bible about a blind man. This man, when healed by Jesus, saw people like trees walking about. This is in the eighth chapter of the Gospel of Mark. So let me read the story to you, and you can see it here for those of you uh, well, and I, I hope the Zoom, the Zoom audience as well, you can see here the text of the story. Let me read it. So they came to Bethesda and some people brought a blind man to Jesus and they begged him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand and he led him out of the village. And then he spat in his eyes and he laid his hands on him and he asked him, can you see anything? And the man looked up and said, I can see people but they look like trees walking about. And then Jesus laid his hands on his eyes again, and he looked intently, and now his sight was restored, and he saw everything clear. So after being spat on, and in response to Jesus's query, can you see anything? The blind man peers through the saliva, his saliva-caked eyes, 
And he says, well, I can see people like trees walking about. Now, traditionally, this story is read this way, that at first the man's vision is only partially corrected because he muddles together people and trees. And then Jesus touches him a second time and the man can see everything with clarity. But this interpretation, I think, misses the point of the story. I think the moral of the story is that both modes of seeing, the kind of muddled together eyesight and then the clear sighted eyesight, both are crucial for the man to enjoy full vision. It's not that the man partially sees in the first instance and then completely sees in the second, it's that the man's initial perception, rather, of the human-like qualities of nearby trees, his insight, if I could say this, his insight into the personhood of these tall woody plants. This is the necessary condition for his full spectrum ability to see everything. Talking about the personhood of trees, this goes back to what you might call animism. Now, this term has a troubled past, but today the notion of animism stand, stands for the time-honored belief that all things are imbued with spirit. All things are beings who are alive with personhood and self-awareness and the capacity to be in relationship with other beings. All things plants and animals, rocks and fungus, mountains and rivers, all things are persons who are filled with spirit or soul. In traditional cultures, it's sometimes said that all of us are persons, but only some of us are human. Among indigenous people, there are, for example, bird people, river ancestors, mountain gods, wolf nations, thunder beings, and tree people. A teeming mass of different but related life forms, all endowed with divine presence and inviolable rights. Many North American Lakota people signal the presence of their, of their interdependence with other living beings by saying, mitakayue, Oyasin, which means all my relations. And this invocation celebrates the vibrant community of kinfolk, the human persons and the more than human persons that form together a web of mutual relationships. So let's add Christianity to animism and see what that looks like. We could call that Christian animism. And Christian animism is simply the recovery of this ancient worldview within the deep genetic code of religious faith. The aim of this recovery is to give new life to the church's central teaching that God became flesh and dwells among us, as the Gospel of John says. So the core grammar of Christian faith is always twofold or it's hyphenated. The heavenly and the earthly are unified. The transcendent and the this worldly are the same reality. Divinity and all of created matter subsist together as one body, as one flesh. Christian animism isn't a recipe like chili con carne. It's the glad tidings of Dios con carne. The eternal Godhead is carnally incarnated, literally made into meat within the roots and the bones and the blood and the feathers and the flesh of all created beings. The good news that God is promiscuously enfleshed in all physical forms, knits together all of Christian scripture and tradition. God walks about the Garden of Eden during an evening breeze. God becomes vegetal in the burning bush that talks to Moses. God answers his servant Job out of a whirlwind. God entangles God's self in the scarred and bleeding flesh of his son. And as the Holy Spirit 
God enfeathers herself as a dove when alighting upon Jesus at the time of his baptism. So if you read the Bible with green eyes, you discover that it's an animist palimpsest. It shows the traces of its fleshy origins everywhere, even though much of official Christianity has tried to erase these animist traces. And with green eyes, you discover that Jesus' miracle in Mark 8, this is really a two-step process in which the steps should be understood in a complementary, not in a, successive, in a successive fashion. So in the first instance, the blind man's right brain, as it were, is restored. He gains the ability to perceive the true interrelational character of all beings, and especially trees and humans, as living persons together who are walking about. And in the second instance, his left brain is healed. He now sees with precision not only the unity, but also the differences between trees and humans. He sees the relative boundary lines between the more than human world of trees alongside the human world. Today, science highlights the value not only of left brain critical perception, but also right brain unitary thinking. Our tree friends and we human people were not entirely the same, but we're also, and perhaps most importantly, we're much alike. Trees like us enjoy rich and varied emotional lives. Like us, they have emotional feelings and distinctive moods and particular ways of behaving and communicating. When threatened, trees send out nasty tannins and dangerous gases to ward off predators. When in love, they produce sweet smelling pheromones and electrical signals, often through underground fungal networks, and thereby teach one another how to live together with enough soil and light and nutrients for everyone to flourish. Nowadays, foresters and ecologists recognize that trees and humans are similar. We actually look alike, we're tall and we're upright, and we rely on one another for food and nurture. So is it any wonder that the healing of the blind man consisted first and foremost in his newfound ability to see the deep connection between human persons and tree people. And to see this connection not as a stage to be overcome in the healing process, but as the necessary condition of the man's progress towards full-sightedness. At first glance, it seems that assigning personhood to trees operates in a kind of make-believe or fantasy world a child's world completely irrelevant to modern life. But the power of what we might call everyday animism, the power of everyday animism to transform our basic existence is now reverberating across the global spectrum and especially in the political realm. Let me quickly give three examples of this dynamic today. One's from Ecuador, one's from Bolivia, and one is from New Zealand. In 2008, Ecuador created a new constitution that enshrined fundamental rights for Mother Earth. The constitution refers to Mother Earth as Pachamama. This is from the Quechuan language derived from the ancient Inca Empire. Now the Ecuadorian constitution says, quote, we are celebrating nature, the Pachamama or Mother Earth, of which we are a part and which is vital to our existence. And it goes on to say, persons and communities are bearers of rights and shall enjoy the rights guaranteed to them in this constitution and nature shall be the subject of those rights that the constitution recognizes for it. And what are those rights that the constitution recognizes? It says specifically there are three. Nature has the right to integral respect for its existence. Nature has the right to the maintenance and regeneration of its life cycles. And nature has the right to be restored. Ecuador was the first country in the world to, great, to grant basic rights to Mother Earth. 
It has followed up this revolutionary judicial philosophy with new legal doctrines that challenge the everyday assumption that nature is dead inert matter with no inherent value apart from its utility for human use. But just last year, Ecuador's highest court revoked a state mining company's extraction permits in a national forest in the northwestern part of the country. The high court appealed to the constitution's mother earth provisions as the basis of its ruling that mining would likely damage the fragile and threatened ecosystem of the forest. In animist parlance, mining would traumatize the body of Pachamama. Bolivia did something similar in 2010. It passed, quote, the law of the rights of Mother Earth, end of quote, in which Pachamama is defined as a dynamic living system comprising an indivisible community of all living beings and organisms, an interrelated and interdependent organism which shares a common destiny. Mother Earth is considered sacred the world views of nations and peasant indigenous peoples, as the Bolivian law states. Thus, Mother Earth is the bearer of what you could call legal personhood. That is, Mother Earth is the possessor of inviolable natural rights. She's revered as sacred based on the ancient animist worldviews of indigenous people and especially the Quechuan people, the same cultural group noted in the case in Ecuador. Here again, animist sensibilities gives life to this new legal framework. According to indigenous communities, human beings are obliged to preserve and restore the fragile health of mother earth with an eye towards all beings, common personhood and common destiny. And a third example, everyday animism in New Zealand. In 2017, the New Zealand parliament decreed that the giant Wanganui River, a river that cuts the heart of the country's South Island, that this river should now be recognized as a living sacred being with inherent legal rights. This unique law is designed to preserve what the original people of New Zealand referred to as the mana, or the power of the river, or the Maori, the life force of the river. This new legislation stipulates that the Wanganui River is, quote, a living and invisible whole from the mountains to the sea, incorporating its tributaries and all of its physical and metaphysical elements, end quote. So the river has a set of intrinsic values, including the rights, powers, and duties of a legal person. And the river is more than just a physical body of water. To use animist ways of speaking, the Wanganui River comprises metaphysical elements insofar as, and quoting here the document, insofar as it is a spiritual and physical entity that sustains the well-being of all life within its bountiful watershed. As is the case with Ecuador and Bolivia, New Zealand's parliamentary act stems directly from the animist values inherent in the indigenous belief system of the Aboriginal Maori. And this law, just like in Ecuador and Bolivia, is now sending shock waves through greater Polynesia as the practical political work of preserving the Wanganui River's health and integrity, its divine personhood, as it were, as this work continues apace. We inhabit today a planet where everything is a commodity. Every part of the world has been monetized as an asset or a product to be bought and sold in the marketplace. Education is a consumer good. Healthcare is a for-profit business. Food production is controlled by corporate interests. Fans of the natural world and its life-giving systems has been reduced to a commercial enterprise within the worldwide economy. Market privatization of all goods and services is the dominant feature of contemporary society. How could the ancient idea of animism and its political corollary, mother earth politics, how could that offer 
a counter testimony to the values of the free market within global capitalism. Considering the indigenous science of Robin Wall Kimmerer, a member of the Potawatomi Nation and a plant biologist at SUNY Syracuse. Kimmerer writes in her indigenous, in her indigenous Potawatomi language, she writes that rocks are animate as are mountains and water and fire and places. These are all beings that are imbued with spirit and they are all animate. She continues that one of her community's central rituals, braiding sweet grass, this embeds her in the beauty of a world replete with medicinal and nutrition for everyone. And she talks about braiding the silky strands of sweet grass into a basket breathing in its fragrance, catching sight of its rich color scheme, feeling its soft tendrils. This is a palpable experience, braiding the hair as she puts it of mother earth. Braiding sweet grass is the same as braiding the hair of mother earth. For me, many years ago, bumping headlong into a wolf, opened me to the prospect of another world that I couldn't imagine. Like the blind man who when healed saw walking trees in front of him, I now see that this new world is an animist habitat populated by a myriad of life forms whom are bearers of living spirit and sacred value. I see a world of beauty and grace and wonder. And is, it is the world's beauty that will save the world. Not angry politics, not despair over what we haven't done, not guilty hand wringing that it is too late for us to intervene and mitigate the effects of the storm that is now upon us. No. It's rather a cultivated sense of gratitude and wonder for the many splendored earth that we all inhabit, save the earth. It is this sense of awe in the lap of Mother Earth's gratuitous beauty and bounty that will be, in my judgment, the ground tone of a new politics for our time. For Kimmerer, the ritual of braiding sweet grass is the same as braiding the hair of Mother Earth. In this work, in, in this vein, the work of climate justice, of environmental restoration, of racial and economic equity should now be considered by us as caring for the wonder and well being of Mother Earth and her many inhabitants. And so finally, going forward, we could then say together, when we cleanse the atmosphere that gives us breath, we repair the damaged lungs of Mother Earth. When we tend to the rivers and the seas that sustain all beings, we tend to the circulatory system of Mother Earth. When we restore natural habitats to their life-giving potential, we are loving the body of Mother Earth. And when we care for the brokenhearted in our midst, for those who are suffering from mass incarceration, ethnic cleansing, gender-based violence, and intergenerational poverty, we will bind up the wounds of Mother Earth. Thank you. Is that good? Is that all I want to do? Oh. This? No, 
I'm struck with the way Mark describes Christian animism as an everyday phenomenon. You talk a lot about socio-political issues, things that you know strike to the core of our political lives, but it seems it's it's even more than that. It obviously suggests that such a religious experience is common, if not ubiquitous, in our lives. An everyday religious experience seemingly need not occur as some grand epiphany that radically recalibrates our existence, although it may of course do so. But instead, it sounds like something that could very well have happened to you already today, perhaps even several times. The spirit behind everyday Christian animism is that there is no absolute or even coherent divide between the sacred and the profane. It insists with the Apostle Paul that we live and move and exist within a religious ecology and that divinity is the very air that we breathe. Yet, as we are all aware, everyday activities are so ingrained within our existence that we may fail to notice that they occur at all. And if such is in fact the case for everyday religion, we could easily not recognize that we have come face to face with God. In this case, everyday religion may be so common that it ironically becomes mysterious insofar it is, as it is mostly hidden from our waking perception. That is, we experience it continually, but rarely, if ever, do we realize what's happening in the waking present. As such, if all our relations are indeed with willful beings, persons who strive to be fulfilled in their own particular ways, and if such beings constitute a deeper religious ecology, wherein divine incarnation extends throughout all physical forms, we should consider ways that we might habituate ourselves to recognize meaningful divine encounters in our own lives, or at least be able to recognize that they have occurred, even if we're not initially aware of it. So what I'm saying is it's one thing to speak of the mythic encounters with God in our tradition. God walks about the Garden of Eden. God becomes vegetal in the burning bush, who talks to Moses, answers Job out of the whirlwind, entangles himself in the scarred and bleeding flesh of his son, and then feathers herself as a dove, when alighting upon Jesus at the time of his baptism. It's another thing altogether to recognize that such encounters, even if they're mythic, are indicative of a real everyday phenomenon that puts us in touch with the divine, even if we do not recognize immediately that we have been faced by God. So while I suppose there's a plurality of ways to recognize that we've encountered God, for me, it's the divine command, you shall not murder, that reveals the heart of the Judeo-Christian tradition and is the core expression of all divine speech, or at least divine speech that's worthy of religious devotion. From the Sinai revelation of God incarnate as the fiery plant or the booming thundercloud to the divine rebellion manifest in the life and teachings of the peasant revolutionary Jesus. The words of the prophet Micah summarize the divine heart and the core of its expression to humanity. God has shown you, O mortal, what is good and what does the Lord require of you to act justly and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. In our experience, the divine heart is confirmed not by appeals to scripture or the authority of religious figures such as Moses, but in the compulsion to care for others felt in the everyday experience, the everyday phenomenon of compassion. 
something we are often not even aware of until we awaken in reflection on how the suffering or vulnerability of another has made us feel. While everyday animism may take other forms and expression, Mark spoke of fear and awe in the presence of the wolf, for example, the vulnerable face of our other than human neighbors establish a clear and common occurrence that might anchor our everyday religious experience. And this may be a radical idea, but it's not unheard of in the Judeo-Christian tradition. One of the most prominent philosophical interpreters of Judaism in the 20th century, Emmanuel Levinas writes, my neighbor's face has an alterity which is not allergic, but opens up the beyond. The Talmud states it in that apparently childish language that earns it in the eyes of many who read it curiously, the reputation of allowing inextricable complications to a disarming na na nativity, nativity, na naivete. The Talmud says, God never came down from Sinai. Moses never ascended to heaven. But God folded back the heavens like a cover, covered Sinai with it, and so found himself on earth without ever having left heaven. There is here, Lebanon says, a desacralization of the sacred. And Mark has said something deeply similar this evening, that the Christian faith is always twofold or hyphenated. The heavenly and the earthly are unified. The transcendent and the this worldly, the same reality. Divinity and all of created matter subsist together as one body, one flesh. And so Mark began by speaking of an encounter with a wolf I'm going to end by speaking of uh, a my encounter with a worm. I hadn't planned on speaking of worms, but the more I considered how common everyday animism might actually be, the more I considered some of the most common, mundane, and this is the point of talking about a worm, seemingly insignificant. And I would add maybe one of the more embarrassing or the stupidest times I've ever been moved to compassion by another who compelled me to merciful action. And I know it sounds stupid, it's a worm, but even justice. In these moments, their solicitation of compassionate care polymorphs them into a cruciform object of religious devotion. It ma they manifest the divine command. So I share this possibly idiotic anecdote to encourage all of us to recognize just how common these everyday experiences might be, how deep compassion might actually run, and how everyday religion might permeate even our most ignoble experiences. So at dinner one evening last summer, Jackie and I sat outdoors at a neighborhood restaurant in Washington, DC. And DC summers are hot and unfriendly to anyone without adequate protection from the elements. I glanced at the sidewalk near our table. A worm was writhing aimlessly in the heat and narrowly avoiding the crushing weight of pedestrian feet. And there's something about a writhing body uh, that our humanity picks up on, not in a cognitive manner, but a visceral one. I didn't reflect on worm anatomy in that moment. I didn't speculate on its will. I didn't calculate its utility value. I simply felt bad for it. This compassion, what Arthur Schopenhauer describes as the holy immediate sympathy toward another's suffering and hence toward the prevention or removal of this suffering appears to result from the worms moving me. Nothing in this relation was intentional. My desire was substituted by its will to live. In a moment of what I truly believe qualifies as religious devotion in the face of cruciform suffering, 
and to the horror of Jackie and everyone at this not exactly fancy, but pretty nice Italian restaurants, I stood up and I grabbed the worm and I tossed it into the dirt surrounding uh, a nearby tree. Uh, everyday Christian animism is likely more than this kind of compassion. Feelings of fear in the face of wolves or wonder in the face of the cosmos likewise inspire religious feeling. But the everyday phenomena of compassionate care is a necessary focus in any religious ethic. So your questions, criticism, observations, anything that you would like to ask me or Matt as well. Eager to hear. Please. A, a question from, from Zoom. Please. Uh, we have a, a number. So uh, this one's about animism. Mm -hmm. You could have expected it, I imagine. <laughs> so. Uh, <laughs> Past. One way to put this question might be whether there, there's reason for it to have troubled past. Yeah. Uh, let me combine that. There's a longer question like that. So if animism is the view that everything is animated by spirit, to be animated by spirit is to have value, even to be sacred, this all hierarchy, all better and worse, fall away. Or yeah. Are, are there greater and lesser sacred things, things that have more or less value? Right. Uh, you know, for example, viruses, let's say. Right, right. That's a really good question. Um, so I hope at some point, Matt, we can talk about the issues that you raised as well. Yeah, that you raised as well. Um, let me turn to this question and um, it's really a, a really good question. Um, let me say a couple of things. One about animism's troubled past and the other about whether animism undercuts any kind of hierarchy of values. So animism is a term that was coined by um, white supremacist academics in England and the United States in the 19th century to describe the childish and outmoded ways of seeing the world that traditional people engage in. So it's a term that was deployed as a put down, as a kind of uh, a pejorative dismissal of the um, outmoded worldviews of primordial people who saw everything as filled with spirit. And in that perspective, in the 19th century uh, academic world, animism was used then as a kind of wedge to describe what has been left behind and now what we civilized uh, uh, people that we are, I, I say that with, with some mockery, but now that, now that we've left that behind, we are moving in an evolutionary schema away from animism towards responsible politics, um, uh, uh, organized religion, society that is no longer beholden to spirit, but recognizes that the world should be divided between humans, which are bearers of spirit and intelligence and uh, rich emotional lives and everything else that fades in relation to us. That's how animism was first understood. Today, animism has been reclaimed, much like the term queer. In my growing up, queer was used as a way to put somebody else down because of their gender identity or their sexual orientation. Today, queer has been redeployed as a term to describe ways of understanding gender that are non-binary and are not conforming to traditional understandings of binary gender. 
And animism, like queer, is also being used today to describe a way of inhabiting the world in which everything is alive. Everything is in relationship to everything else and everything in that sense is of value and even of sacred value. But then that raises the question, if everything is of sacred value, rocks and trees, bodies of water, the atmosphere, particular landscapes, uh, humans and non-human animals, if everything is of value as a bearer of the spirit, as, a, as the bearer of spirit or the bearer of the sacred, how can we make decisions about what we can and can't do with these other beings, all of whom now from an animist perspective are imbued with spirit and of sacred value. One way to talk about that is to, and I'll quote here or paraphrase uh, a mid 20th century environmentalist from the state of Wisconsin named Aldo Leopold. Leopold said, whatever promotes the health and well-being of a particular biotic unity is good. And whatever detracts from the health and well-being of this particular living community is not. So value decisions, what resources, now as living beings, but what resources can and can't be used, how one makes decisions about the environment, about economics, about family, about society, how these decisions get made, get made now from an animist perspective is with an eye towards the health and well-being of particular living communities. And what promotes the health and well-being of those communities is good and what tends otherwise is not. And in the legal documents that I read to you from uh, Ecuador and Zealand, that's how they understand the need to preserve the well-being of the body of Mother Earth is practices that contribute to the well-being of Mother Earth are practices that are encouraged and those don't, like in the one case that I mentioned in terms of a particular mining example, then get discouraged or are outright banned because of the damage that they do to Earth's integrity. Thank, thank you for those questions. What's about from the audience? Is there are more Zoom questions? Right now, too. Everybody can see you. <laughs> All right. One more Zoom question. Okay. And maybe we can talk okay. to some, some people. So uh, it was observed that you began by uh, talking about. Christianity, but then you drew much more from indigenous belief systems. So are, are there important differences? And I'm, I'm going to make that a little bit more precise. You spoke earlier about uh, a promiscuous incarnation. Mm -hmm. Is there a difference between promiscuous incarnation and let's say the Ignatian finding God in all things? Yeah. Are yeah. those different? Should they be differentiated? Yeah. So let me reference something uh, Matt said that I think is really important here. And he talked about passage from the book of Acts in the New Testament, where Paul says, um, paraphrasing, that God is the one within whom we live and move and have our being. And clearly Paul is thinking about God, yes, as the identifiable father of Jesus, but he's also thinking about God in a different way. Thinking about God as something much more amorphous and, and universal and, and, and spatially not located in one place, like heaven, but now seemingly everywhere. God is the one within whom we live and move and have our being. I think the religions and the worldview of traditional people is the great hope of the Christian religion. But the Christian religion at its core is animist. 
lost on us as so-called civilized people. We don't see that anymore. We don't read the Bible or understand Christian tradition in, in that way. I was struck when Matt picked me up. We were walking through campus and there was a beautiful statue of St. Francis with a wolf. This is a famous story of Francis entering into a very deep and meaningful relationship with a wolf, the wolf of Gubbio in Italy. That wasn't the relationship I had with the wolf. Whatever that was that encountered me in that lagoon terrified me. And that animal understood something about me. It didn't rip my throat out. And the young woman who was nominally in charge of the wolf wasn't around at the moment the wolf confronted me. There was something that happened there. A kind of relationship. Francis understood that coming out of the Christian tradition that he could have a relationship with birds that he would preach to and this wolf that he became a friend, a friend with. This for the most part has been lost on non-indigenous, non-native Christianity. So it's a really good question. Um, traditionally, Christianity saw itself at war with traditional people, with animist people, with people who practiced fertility rituals and who built altars to various uh, nature gods and goddesses in forests and in landed natural places. In my judgment, the Christian church took a wrong turn when it did those and my hope is to return, again, from my perspective, Christianity to its true roots in the way that indigenous and native and first people understand the world as filled with spirit and alive with God. Are there differences between Christianity as we understand it and the worldviews of traditional peoples? There are differences. I would call Christianity an exercise in forgive this kind of uh, language, but as an exercise in what you might want to call transcendental animism. Christianity at its core, its fundamental grammar is animus, also postulates that there is God, while here with us in every respect, that God is also elsewhere as well. And that God who is elsewhere while often understood in animist traditions as uh, a way of thinking that those traditions support, that way of thinking that God is not only in the world, but also other than the world, that way of thinking is very important to traditional Christianity. And I think it should be preserved. But at its core, Christianity and animism are flip sides of the same coin. And that's, uh, I'm suggesting a truth that has been lost. Now, those of you who are here, what do you think of this? I mean, you can respond, I can respond more to Zoom queries. And I'd like people to answer. There's a lot of stuff that's been put. Those of you who are here, what, what do you think of this? What seems confusing or mind opening to you? Yes, please. Sorry, we were talking about value and mentioned about consumerism. Can you talk a little bit more about how we've gotten ourselves there? God's everywhere in our lives. Yeah. I, I got everything you said except that last part. Yeah, like about, that, we about were talking how God's everywhere. In oh, Australia, right. So, right. So, how, did, how can it be, in, if from a consumer's perspective, everything is now to be bought and sold? So, um, the true religion of our time isn't the Christian church or the Buddhist Sangha or the Muslim mosque. The true religion of our time is the religion of the market. Everything has become monetized. Everything has become an object to be bought and sold. And that, from that perspective, nothing is sacred anymore because everything can be cashed out, rendered in dollars and cents, pushed as a good or a service. And that's the world we live in. And that's the dominance of the marketplace in our own time. There's nothing wrong with markets. But when markets dictate to us how to understand all existence, 
then we're in a bad place. And that's the place that we're in now. as a society. And I don't just mean American society, I mean as a global society. That's why we're not able to find ourselves committed to caring for and loving and tending to Mother Earth and the damage and the trauma that we have inflicted on her. Because we don't think of Earth as our mother, we think of the Earth, resources, oil, products, food, whatever. We think of the Earth and all of its bounty as an object to be extracted. And it's the extraction mentality that that dominates our mindset. So what I'm suggesting is that in the cracks and in the fissures of this dominant market religion, so to speak, we find ways to listen to and to see another world that's not captive to the world of the market. And I think for many of us, that happens in natural surroundings. And to cultivate then spending as much time as we can in natural places that have not been hopelessly degraded uh, by the marketplace. That to me is the panacea for the disease that, that afflicts us. Thank you for your question. Please. Mark, we have some, some very theologically sophisticated Please. people. Uh, Please. I'm not saying we don't hear. <laughs> so some, so some that'd be great. But um, so one question is how um, sin, suffering, and evil fit uh, or figure within um, yeah. what's called a Christian animism. Right. Uh, and a related question. Um, I'm just throwing one difficult question after another at you. I apologize. No. Uh -uh. Uh, if there's struggle and conflict in the world and all the sacred. Does that suggest that there is a conflict in the very core of God? Mm. And then, is that a problem? <laughs> no, yeah, all sacred. <laughs> and there's conflict. Is there a conflict in God? Yeah. So sin, evil, suffering. Yeah. And yeah. There's conflict among uh, you know, here right. in creation, everything is sacred. Is there likewise conflict within God? Within yeah. God? So... Uh, let me say something about the first question first, and then I'll say something about the second one. So where does sin and suffering and evil fit into Christian animism? And I'm going to pick up on something else that Matt said. At the center of the Christian religion is Jesus on the cross. And that's a disturbing and ugly and grotesque image. It's been sanitized and domesticated for us. We wear crosses around our necks. We see them in churches and here and there. But if you think about it, it's a pretty horrible image. And what the image, I think, communicates to us is not only that God in Jesus was crucified, but that the world, insofar as we keep doing to one another and others what our ancestors did to Jesus, that the world, and this I'm picking up on Matt's phrasing here, that the world then is cruciform. It's not just that Jesus bears the lash marks of human sin. It's that the whole world now shows the cut marks, the torture, the horror of what happened to him now it's everywhere. The world is crucified. The world is Golgotha. The world is the place of the skull. And because it's become that way, because we can look and we can see the marks of sin and suffering and trauma everywhere, what do we do about that? We bind up the wounds of those who suffer. We tend to the trauma and the horror. And we understand that our religion trains us to pay for those of us who identify as Christian. For those of us who identify as Christian, our religion 
trains us to look at suffering so that when we see suffering in others, and I don't just mean human others, I mean the more than human others, like Matt's Washington DC worm, that when we see the more than human others and the face of suffering in them, we attend to that suffering. So I think Christian animism empowers us to recognize God's trauma in all things. And when I look at the cross now, I think about how the cross casts a long shadow over the whole world. But that should then empower me to want to care. The question about the sacred and conflict, and if all is sacred, and if the world is cruciform, if it, if it bears the lash marks of sin, and we see it, if the world is sacred and the world is also riven with conflict, is there conflict in God? Yes, that's exactly who God is. God is at cross currents with God's self. In a certain way of speaking, God is at war with God's self. And in particular, at the point in which God's son suffers on the cross. If you think about it, when Jesus is on the cross, and in two of the four gospel accounts, cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Think about what's going on there. This guy thinks that he's doing his father's will. He thinks he's going to the cross because that's what he's been asked to do. And at the point in which he does that, he feels emotionally that his father has abandoned him. And somehow, for those of us who follow that story, we have to keep both of those dynamics together in their impossible contradictory tension, but understanding still that they somehow could be reconciled to each other. God and God's love and compassion and empathy for his son asked him to suffer on a cross. And we look at that cross and we see the inner conflict, not only within Jesus feeling its abandonment, but within God and God. So uh, to me, that's what Christian animism gives birth to is a hope and desire to love the earth again as God's flesh. We will only save what we love, as um, one biologist put it once. We will only save what we love. And if we can't find a way to fall in love with the planet again, we won't save it. Faith can help us get there, but it's a faith that's troubled because it's a faith it's a faith that while we recognize the beauty and the wonder of the world, it's also a world that is fundamentally, that fundamentally been traumatized. And we have to keep both the joy and the wonder and the trauma and the horror together at the same time. Please. So since there's been so much about how we've gotten to the point where we are, I think people should take religion as like a sign of hope or the sign of faith moving forward since it's been such like a strong part of yeah. people's lives. And I feel like I don't know, maybe nowadays it's not as strong as it used to be, but right. how should people see religion as like that sign of hope? We're in this like we're in this like, Yeah. yeah. Yeah, how can religion, yeah, how can, given the trauma and the pain and suffering we see around us, and given, as you said, that maybe religion doesn't play the same role today as it used to play, the same important role, how can religion be a source of hope, right? Uh, so, look, if, without religion, without faith, I look out across the landscape 
across the world, across the marketplace, and I see horror, and I see uh, suffering, and I see people and other life forms being evacuated of their sacred work. I think what religion and faith enables us to do uh, is to see, as I put it earlier, is to see another world in the eyes and in the face, as, as Matt was saying, of that other person. And in the way I talk about Christian animism, now all beings have personhood. All beings have faces, rocks, trees, bodies of water, landscapes, plants, they all have faces. That religion helps us see the face of the other in all of its vulnerability. To, and then it helps to move us to care for the other. Mother Teresa, Mother Teresa said, when I look into the face of the other, I see Jesus in all of his many and terrible disguises. And that's the attitude of faith. Without faith, I just see that person in their trauma and I may or may not be moved to intervene. But with faith, I can see God peeking through that face of that other, summoning me to exercise care and compassion and responsibility for their welfare, even as I hope they will do that for me as well. So I think that's what it gives us hope that maybe we can find a way to engage others as sacred. We're good. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody here, and thanks to everybody. On, uh, our, we're in the same crowded space. Thanks to everybody on Zoom, stuck with us to the very end. Thanks to everybody here for staying. All right. Thanks, people.